All right, guys. Thank you guys for joining me. We are going to be looking at Nehemiah chapter 5 today, guys. Chapter 5. Um, hope everybody's having a great Sunday out there, man. God is so good, guys. God is so good. You know, I was mowing the yard the other day, and I don't know. It's just beautiful. You know, it's pretty amazing that this is the fallen world, and it's still full of this much cool and amazing stuff like nature has to offer us. Um, really makes you wonder what it was like in its, in its perfect state to begin with. Um, let's pray, guys, and we'll jump into Nehemiah. Heavenly Father, I just want to come before you today, Lord, grateful, thankful, satisfied, and alive, God. Thank you for the breath in my lungs, Lord. Thank you for saving me from the, um, from the mess that I was tied up in for so long, God. Thank you for allowing me to maintain relationships with family and with friends, God. Thank you for allowing me to just have this life, God, that's so much better than I could have ever imagined it being. So much more rewarding than I could have ever imagined it being. So much different than I could have ever Imagine it being, Lord, what you have for us is so wonderful, God. Help us to never lose sight of that. Help us to seek that out more fully and to achieve that more fully and to exhibit that more fully to others, God. Help us to shine as that city on a hill or that light that cannot be put up under a basket, Lord. That light that's got to shine, that song that's got to be sung, God. That, that prayer that has to be prayed, that praise that has to be praised. Thank you, Father God, for all that you offer us, Lord. Thank you for your Son and the work that he did for us on the cross, Lord. Thank you for the gift of the Holy Spirit as a helper. I ask that this video, Lord, be a nourishment to your flock, and I ask that it be a, a siren to those in need, to anyone still lost to the lies of the enemy and the perversions of wickedness and the... Um, the, the, the misleading nature of sin itself, God. Um, I would ask, Father God, for a blood covering over the hearts and minds and a hedge of protection around the lives of those unable to take care of themselves or to protect themselves, God. And I would pray all of this in your holy and heavenly name, guys, in Jesus' name. Man, he's good, guys. Let's look at Nehemiah 5. <clears throat> Nehemiah deals with oppression is the heading on mine. Chapter 5, verse 1, guys. And there was a great outcry of the people and their wives against their Jewish brethren. For there were those who said, We, our sons, and our daughters are many. Therefore let us get grain that we may eat and live. There were also some who said, We have mortgaged our lands and vineyards and houses that we might buy grain because of the famine. There were also those who said, We have borrowed money for the king's tax on our lands and vineyards, yet now our flesh is as the flesh of our brethren, our children as their children, and indeed we are forcing our sons and our daughters to be slaves, and some of our daughters have been brought into slavery. It is not in our power to redeem them, for other men have our lands and vineyards. And I became very angry when I heard their outcry and these words. After serious thought, I rebuked the nobles and rulers and said to them, Each of you is exacting usury from his brother. So I called a great assembly against them, and I said to them, According to our ability, we have redeemed our Jewish brethren who were sold to the nations, now indeed, will you even sell your brethren, or should they be sold to us? Then they were silenced and found nothing to say. Then I said, What you are doing is not good. Should you not walk in the fear of our God? 
because of the reproach of the nations, our enemies, I also, with my brethren and my servants, am lending them money and grain. Please, let us stop this usury. Restore now to them, even this day, their lands, their vineyards, their olive groves, and their houses. Also, a hundredth of the money and the grain, the new wine and the oil that you have charged them. So they said, we will restore it and will requ we'll require nothing from them. We will do as you say. Then I called the priest and required an oath from them that they would do according to this promise. Then I shook out the fold of my garments and said, So may God shake out each man from his house and from his property who does not perform this promise. Even thus may he be shaken out and emptied. And all the assembly said, Amen, and praised the Lord. Then the people did according to this promise. Moreover, from the time that I was appointed to be their governor in the land of Judah, from the twentieth year until the thirty-second year of King Artaxerxes, twelve years, neither I nor my brothers ate the governor's provisions. But the former governors who were before me laid burdens on the people, and took from them bread and wine, besides forty shekels of silver. Yet, yes, even their servants bore rule over the people. But I did not do so, because of the fear of God. Indeed, I also continued the work on this wall, and we did not buy any land. All my servants were gathered there for the work. And at my table were 150 Jews and rulers, besides those who came to us from the nations around us. Now that which was prepared daily was one ox and six choice sheep. Also, fowl were prepared for me, and once every ten days an abundance of all kinds of wine. Yet in spite of this, I did not demand the governor's provisions, because the bondage was heavy on this people. Remember me, my God, for good, according to all that I have done for this people. Amen, guys. We really get a chance to kind of get inside Nehemiah's mind a little bit, and it's a pretty good place to be. In a, in a lot of ways, he had he had a lot of very desirable traits, guys. And this is something we can certainly um, glean worthwhile stuff from, especially in the place that we're at today. <clears throat> All right, guys. So, hey, thank you for coming along as we are blessed to look here at Nehemiah's chapter 5. Before moving on to verses, I'd first like to offer background and really talk about what we see here, particularly in the opening 13 verses. Outside opposition has been the main topic here in Ezra and even in Nehemiah. But here in this chapter, we sort of shift gears. We see not outside opposition, but rather we see internal oppositions, internal divisions, internal stress, internal strife, internalized troubles. Economic quicksand, for lack of a better word, grasp at these people, and we have them crying out, not to, but against one another, at a time when they should be able to cry out, to one another. Judah has dealt with embargoes where basically trade is being cut off from outside networks. The rebuilding effort has pulled would-be farmers from their fields and their fields are left where they're at with nothing being done with them as they go to take part in this great rebuilding effort. High taxes and famine are crushing these people. Mortgages are being taken out on businesses and homes as well as on land, all of it at exorbitant interest rates. This produces a dilemma wherein children are being forced into slavery, sold as indentured servants. The owners of such are themselves Jewish. Nehemiah voices a rebuke about this, and he says to the wealthy, Follow my lead, fear God Almighty, and freely lend both money and supplies. 
When one practices what they preach, as we see with Nehemiah, they can do and demand great things from a place of righteousness. Nehemiah exhibits for us true righteous anger here. Leviticus 25 verses 34 through 35 is clear. God's people are not to charge interest or usury on loans between one another. So Nehemiah's anger, it is pure and it is pious. Jews are being enslaved. The law is being violated and all of this only serves to diminish the Jewish testimony as a whole to outside nations and peoples. And, and just like today, we must glorify God in all that we do, not some of what we do, not most of what we do. We have got to glorify God Almighty in all we do because all we do is only good because of Him. 5-1, guys. And there was a great outcry of the people and their wives against their Jewish brethren. So we know this was a patriarchy, right? We've talked about that often, how male-dominated this society was. And so, in books like Ezra and Nehemiah, where this is particularly prevalent, the female role is minimal. So when we see them expressly mentioned, like we do here in verse 1, it really aids in showing the severity of the very nature of this crisis that they are dealing with. 5-3. <clears throat> there were also some who said, We have mortgaged our lands and vineyards and houses that we might buy grain because of the famine. All right, guys, so it's well established in Scripture that famines often serve as signs of God's judgment. Notable in this is Deuteronomy chapter 11, verses 16 and 17, First Chronicles chapter 21, verse 12, and we see it in Haggai in chapter 1, verses 7 through 11 as well. While it's not recorded here, it's possible that this famine was in fact a righteous God's judgment in response to the leadership and those in power and wealth failing at a base level to do what's right. They're, they're directly violating this law, which we'll talk about very shortly. 5-4. There were also those who said, we have borrowed money from the king's tax on our lands and vineyards. So those in power show a really shady view to the general populace. This king's tax, check this out, guys. This king's tax... This was a property tax that could only, only be paid by way of mortgaging one's property to settle up. Not cool. Very predatory. 5-5. Five, five. Yet now our flesh is as the flesh of our brethren, our children is their children, and indeed we are forcing our sons and our daughters to be slaves, and some of our daughters have been brought into slavery. It is not in our power to redeem them, for other men have our lands and vineyards. Alright guys, so a multifaceted abuse is what we really have going on here. God's word must be the base for God's people, okay? Leviticus 25, verses 39 through 43. Go and read those if you want. It's very clear. A man in the Old Covenant group who becomes poor can sell himself and his family with him to another Israelite to square up and get back on his feet. He is to be viewed and treated as a paid worker and not a slave. Okay, so by Nehemiah's time, the distance of time between Leviticus and Nehemiah, we have a twofold violation or twofold trouble where this law and how it's being applied and used is concerned. There's also the law that says that you cannot charge interest or usury on a fellow Jew. So, 
Here with this law, what we see is that family units are being destroyed as only kids are being, only children are being sold into this slavery, this indentured servitude. And they're not being treated as paid employees. They're being treated exclusively as slaves. Okay? Now, both of these are a clear violation of the law and the very function and purpose behind it. It was intended to help families get back on their feet, not for low lives to be able to sell their children to cover their own debts, or people be able to demand children and not the father or the mother to clear this debt. All of it was very, very wrong. Five nine, guys. But we see them, they will get past this. So that's the hope, right? All right, five nine. Then I said, what you are doing is not good. Should you not walk in the fear of our God because of the reproach of the nations, our enemies? So we should never lose sight of the value of a verse like this. As believers, we should always act, speak, and engage in public conduct that serves expressly to uplift and to enhance that which we profess to believe or follow or live by. The proof is in the pudding. Put your money where your mouth is. Walk the walk. Talk the talk. However you want to say it. 512, guys. So they said, we will restore it and will require nothing from them. We will do as you say. Then I called the priest and required an oath from them that they would do according to this promise. So again, like we've seen prior, this is... Not a new or revised law, but a fresh oath, a fresh vow, a renewed commitment to uphold the already perfect will of God as well as the perfect letter of the law of God. All right, guys, 514. Thank y'all for letting me share God's word with you, man. It's amazing. Moreover, from the time that I was appointed to be their governor in the land of Judah, from the 20th year until the 32nd year of King Artaxerxes, 12 years, neither I nor my brothers ate the governor's provisions. So critics are quickly silenced when one is bold enough to live beyond reproach, to do what you mean and to mean what you do, and have those be worthwhile things. As governor of Judah, Nehemiah had the right to a food allowance. His mouth voiced what his actions declared. He chooses instead to feed 150 workers from this project that is so near and so dear to him. And what a wonderful example of how to conduct oneself in office so as to glorify the Lord Almighty, guys. 515, last one I'm going to share with y'all today. But the former governors who were before me laid burdens on the people and took from them bread and wine besides 40 shekels of silver. Yes, even their servants bore rule over the people, but I did not do so because of the fear of God. Because of the fear of God, guys. How many times do we hear it? The, the beginning of knowledge is the fear of the Lord. The fear of the Lord is the base for everything. And Nehemiah just hammers that point home. He reiterates that point, not only with his mouth, but with his actions. And it's so wonderful, guys. Nehemiah was a man vocal and consistent in his proclamation that his motivation was fear of God. Fear of God Almighty. Never forget that Nehemiah answered to the Persian ruler, a powerful, powerful person, no doubt. Yet not once do we see Nehemiah lose sight of the fact that above all, he was indentured to and accountable to the creator and the sustainer of all. Father God Almighty, our Heavenly Father, our merciful, loving, and graceful Lord. All right, guys, if you're not subscribed, smash the subscribe button. I drop a new video like this six days a week, and I promise, guys, God loves it when we walk in his word, man. That's what he wants from us, guys. So come here, and let's get it done together. Give the video a thumbs up if you liked it. Share it if you loved it. If you have any prayer requests, any comments, guys, I want you to take those, drop those down here into the comment section, really, anything at all, guys. And um, 
I love you guys so much. Father God loves you so much more. Please go out there and have a blessed day, y'all.